Gambling in Iowa was once limited to riverboats, but now most Iowans can place a bet on a smartphone in every corner of the state. What's next for gambling in Iowa? We sit down with Wes Erickey of the Iowa Gaming Association and Brian O'Rilko of the Iowa Racing and Gaming Commission on this edition of Iowa Press. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Fuel Iowa is a voice and a resource for Iowa's fuel industry. Our members offer a diverse range of products, including fuel, grocery, and convenience items. They help keep Iowans on the move in rural and urban communities. Together, we fuel Iowa. Small businesses are the backbone of Iowa's communities, and they are backed by Iowa banks. With advice, loans, and financial services, banks across Iowa are committed to showing small businesses the way to a stronger tomorrow. Learn more at iowabankers.com. For decades, Iowa Press has brought you political leaders and newsmakers from across Iowa and beyond. Celebrating 50 years of broadcast excellence on statewide Iowa PBS, this is the Friday, December 10th edition of Iowa Press. Here is Kay Henderson. Gambling is big business in Iowa, and the just concluded state fiscal year ended on June 30th. The 19 state licensed casinos had revenue topping $1.5 billion. And you can't watch a football game these days without an ad for that sports betting that's now legal in the state. Our two guests have experience in this industry that goes back years, decades. Joining us today is Wes Erickey, president and CEO of the Iowa Gaming Association since the turn of the century, 2000. Uh, the association represents the 19 state licensed casinos and the Iowa Racing and Gaming Commission regulates those 19 state licensed casinos. Brian O'Rilko has been the commission's administrator since 2012. You've been working at the commission, I believe, since 2004. That's right. Thanks for joining us, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Also here for the conversation are Aaron Murphy, Des Moines Bureau Chief for Lee Enterprises, and Clay Masters of Iowa Public Radio. So as Kay mentioned, we've had sports betting in Iowa for a few years now. Uh, Brian Rilko, let me ask you first, uh, how's that going? Uh, how, how much interest has there been in Iowa in uh, sports wagering? Yeah, it, it really has been uh, significant interest in this state, and, and the industry continues to grow. and. Uh, we've kind of have taken a measured, uh, layered approach and an opening with in-person registration. And then when that went away, uh, we really saw things take off. And so every month we continue to see uh, increases in handle. Um, uh, last uh, year we had uh, approximately uh, $6 million in tax revenue to the state. We anticipate that will grow. Um, we have 17 uh, companies that are licensed uh, to conduct uh, online sports wagering, four more that uh, we expect to be licensed here in the next uh, few months. And so the industry continues to grow. Um, we've had uh, very few uh, regulatory issues. Uh, we'll continue to provide regulatory oversight and, and uh, it's just been a really good story uh, to, the, to, to this point in time. So with more companies coming in, we can expect to hear even more of those ads that Kay was talking about, is that right? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. Uh, I, it's a very competitive industry right now. Wes, how is this going in the casinos? Because we have the option for the uh, people can place bets just on their phone, on an app at home. Are, are they also coming to the casinos to, to do this as well? They, that is certainly an option, the retail versus the, the online. The online is probably 80 to 90 percent, but still people that are you know, going to the casino perhaps to, you know, to play blackjack and other things, but will go to the retail uh, to, to you know, place a bet that way. You know, we really we have to applaud the legislature for the, the visionary d efforts to put together a model legislation that Brian alluded to that has made this so successful uh, in this state. We, you know, it's considered recognized around the country, and that's really been uh, good to have both that uh, retail and the, and the mobile uh, for people that love to watch sports and, and wager on sports in a well-regulated, compliant uh, in, environment. But to put a finer um, point on it, you say only 20% of the people who are wagering on sports in Iowa are actually going to a casino to wager? Uh, for sportsbook, uh, that's kind of what I think been the uh, 
than the average uh, around the state. Some are maybe a little bit more. It depends on certain games uh, that they'll have uh, specials and various things for people to come in and be able to watch it and, and be able to, you know, get a, a burger and a, and a beverage. And so, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, another viable entertainment option, not unlike if they were to wager on their phone and, and watch it uh, at home or in some other location. And did that take away any foot track for casinos, the people who are staying home and making bets on their phones, or is that a different clientele anyways? I believe it's a different uh, clientele. Uh, you know, there's some that there's overlap, but I think there's been a lot of folks that just, again, there's a pent-up demand that, you know, the illegal markets before this, but that they would uh, want to watch and uh, wager on uh, sports. And certainly we're one of the only ones in the Midwest, I mean, that to have this. So you have the surrounding states, they have their pro teams, their collegiate teams, and, and so they come across the borders as well to want to place bets. So, Brian, do the casinos feel like they're missing out on some of this money then because of the prevalence of sports betting on smartphones? So we have uh, seen uh, initially there was a, a little bit of a bump when the in-person registration uh, mm -hmm. requirement was in place. Uh, what, we are, what I'm hearing from a number of the operators is that it really is two different types of customers. And so it's not really having an impact one way or the other, uh, uh, except for those uh, in-person events that um, there's a handful of events, whether it's the Super Bowl or March Madness, where the facilities will have a, 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 an, an event and bring people in. And so at this point in time, there isn't a lot of impact. Uh, the way the legislation was set up, uh, the facilities uh, have to, uh, the, the online sports companies have to have an agreement with uh, a casino. And so the casinos are still uh, generating some revenue from the, from the, the sports betting, uh, even if it is occurring online. So I'm curious then too, <clears throat> is gambling addiction becoming a bigger problem with the prevalence than of smartphones uh, to be able to, you know, place a bet on your phone with sports betting, Wes, now that they don't have to physically go somewhere? I would say that it's remained very consistent over the last, you know, 20 years that I've been involved and certainly that, uh, you know, it's unfortunate that people are prone to compulsive behavior, but there's great programs in place and really what we've seen is about 1 to 2% of people that experience that and it hasn't really grown that we've seen with that, but also within the mobile apps, if that's what they're using, there is, uh, uh, you know, the responsible gaming, uh, you know, initiatives that they can take a time out for like three days. They can have, uh, you know, indicate the amount that they want to wager, the amount of time they want to wager. So actually online is, is being probably more proactive with that. But, it, but for people that need help, you know, certainly there is help available. But at the same time, too, it's a lot easier to hide an addiction on a phone than physically going to a place. Uh, so, I mean, what kind of safety precautions are, are in place there, uh, Brian? Yeah, and so it's something that the commission takes very, uh, uh, very seriously. And so uh, the requirements currently in the rules, and, and when we uh, um, helped write the, this section of the rules, it was based on a best practice approach, what we were seeing in other states. Uh, each of the online uh, entities are required uh, to have uh, d different protocols so the customers can easily um, access that and set their individual limits. And so uh, that is something that uh, we do see um, that uh, facilities or that individuals are, are, are doing and it's something they can't do in the real casino. And so it has been a good tool uh, uh, to use that in the, in the online uh, casino world, something we can't do in a brick and mortar setting. And do you know the numbers off, off the top of your head for if people are experiencing gambling addiction? So I don't know uh, okay. with uh, specific to the how many people are taking advantage of the online uh, registration or the online limits. But what we are seeing with our statewide self exclusion program, uh, we have 9,000 people currently enrolled, 7,000 in the the permanent the lifetime ban, and 2,000 in the five year ban. And so we see about 500 a year people coming on and enrolling in those programs, uh, which I believe is is fairly consistent. So it's a slight increase from what we saw before sports wagering but, but um, not material. And if a friend or a loved one is having concerns about a, a family member or so on, how do they seek treatment help? So there are multiple ways, and, and uh, on the, the state, on the, on the Racing and Gaming Commission's website, uh, um, it, we, we can sign up individuals to participate in that list. But uh, uh, separate from that, there are a number of gambling treatment providers uh, uh, across the state, and, and they can call 1-800-BETS-OFF that we can put people in touch with those. We have ads, every ad that we do has, the, it mentions the 800 bets off, so we're very proactive about responsible gaming and it's important to do. Wes Erickie, what's the point of having a brick 
and mortar casino where people walk in the door when you could gamble online. Are, is your casino association going to press legislators to let the Iowa licensed casinos have poker games online? Well, first of all, we're, we're, we're 30 years old now as an industry. We, we, you know, 30 years ago is when this all got created with Riverboat Gaming. And, uh, and so it, we, we evolved with the commission's uh, oversight to be premier entertainment destinations. It's not just gaming. It's, it's the, uh, the, the dining, the hotels, the, the golf courses, the comedy clubs, the you know, a variety of things that are within a casino, plus the concerts and, and conventions and the like, that we've really created a, a premier entertainment destinations in 19 places. So, the so you don't want online So No, the brick and mortar. So I, I would say, though, that, uh, that it's just now in its embryonic stage. There are six states that have currently authorized it. Uh, Connecticut and Delaware, Michigan, New Jersey, uh, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia, mostly out, out, uh, out east. And we're going to watch with that with interest. The gaming association is going to be neutral on that, that. We don't envision any legislation come forward, but if it is, we're going to be neutral. We have some of my members that support looking at it. There are, there are others that are opposed. They have questions and, and thoughts. And so this is going to need to evolve over the next uh, year or two before any, any serious uh, um, uh, legislation or consideration wouldn't happen. So is sports book the gateway drug to online gambling? I wouldn't say it's a gateway drug. I don't think that's a fair thing. This is premier entertainment uh, that uh, people enjoy doing uh, with uh, sports wagering and, and the fact that we've made it a legalized uh, and, uh, thing for so many people that enjoy watching sports and wagering on sports. So uh, people do it for the fun and entertainment that it's intended to be and that's what our casinos are as well. What are the pros and cons that casinos will weigh? You, you talked about some members may be interested, some aren't. What, 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 from the casino's perspective, what, what are the pros and cons to online gaming? And we really haven't got into a lot of that because uh, we didn't envision that there would be legislation coming forward uh, this year. But uh, I think for, for it, they would, they would want to look to see if does it impact the brick and mortar uh, revenue? Uh, is it uh, going to... Um, be something that worth worthwhile, like when we're having our blizzards in the in the winter time and things like that. So there's just ver a variety of things and how to structure it properly, um, and just uh, you know where's the appetite of Iowans and the legislators and everyone to want to to have this as an option. But it's certainly out there now with six states that that have that. But our industry uh, there there needs to be more more focus and more of that will come out I think in the in the upcoming year. Brian O'Rilko is the person who looks at the books, so to speak. How much of every dollar that's wagered at a, one of the 19 state licensed casinos actually stays in Iowa? How much of it goes to Vegas or elsewhere? Yeah, and so it's a, it's a great question. And currently in Iowa, we have a good mix of uh, publicly traded companies and Iowa companies. Uh, a greater share of the revenue uh, uh, of the publicly traded companies, uh, it will leave the state. And that is something we, I don't have specific numbers, um, but, but we do see that. And uh, the focus though, I will say, uh, the commission has really um, worked hard. There's been rules in place um, for years, but there has been a, a focus lately uh, on by Iowa. And so uh, the casinos uh, are required to submit contracts when they spend over $100,000 on any type of service. And the commission uh, thoroughly vets those contracts to make sure that Iowa vendors are getting an opportunity to bid on that. So, so uh, ex it, we have the profits and, and many of those profits, if it is a publicly traded company, uh, some will leave the state, but we do have uh, Iowa companies that they remain, but, but that's not to, to factor in the buy Iowa, uh, the tax revenue, and, the, and then the jobs and all of those. Charitable contributions too. We have we, $90 million in charitable con contributions that go affects really impacts every citizen in the state uh, as well as what he said to buy Iowa first and we're, we're a one billion dollar annual economic impact when you factor in those four things with wages buy Iowa the charitable grants and the taxes a lot of that stays within the state and it does visionary things with that so I wanted to ask you about the Cedar Rapids area and the, their uh, debate over whether to add a casino there and 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 whether the state would licensed such a casino. Uh, they recently had another referendum, which again passed by a smaller, a more narrow nar margin than the first time. Uh, Brian Rocco, my question for you, does that factor into the commission's decision when they see that, that yes, the community improvement, but it, approved it, but it was a little closer this time? Is that a factor they weigh? 
So community support is a factor. There are a number of criteria. It's important to know when we're looking at new applications. It is a very small part of what the commission does, but it is a very important part. And uh, Iowa law, uh, the commission is to decide the number and locations of licenses. Uh, I have been through five of these in different capacities with the commission, uh, very spirited conversations, very, very difficult decisions. Um, there are criteria that are listed in the rules. Uh, they range from public support. They range from the, where, uh, 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 the suitability of the applicant, whether they can uh, um, build the project that they say they can. And then there are economic factors that uh, market impact if there's out-of-state revenue and the overall uh, in, uh, increase to the, to the gaming uh, revenue as a whole to the state. And so um, uh, we are aware of the uh, referenda that passed. We uh, have been informed um, that there is interest from the community to um, submit another application. There's a study right now being conducted. It's a socioeconomic study, but there's also some market components that's due at the end of this calendar year. That would be very helpful to help kind of everyone uh, take a look at the market uh, bef uh, before we see uh, applications and, and, and the time and money that's spent in, in one of these processes. Well, and speaking of the market component, I'm curious just how uh, saturated is the Iowa market right now for, for casinos? You know, there, that's one of the big discussions that happen in Lynn County as if they're ready for a, a casino or if that takes away from other casinos in the state. How do you weigh that, Wes? Well, we really have the commission weigh that because they do a very thorough job with the criteria they have. But, you know, for a couple of my current members that are in that area, they were expected in, 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 with the, to have, uh, you know, some significant investments, over $100 million each in their properties to have premier entertainment destination beyond just gaming, with uh, lodging and a variety of other uh, things. And so, uh, if they're nearby, you, they want to get a good return on their investment as well. So you have to weigh all that in into that. And so this market analysis that uh, Brian ref, uh, alluded to uh, will, will hopefully be telling on what that might look like. We we uh, will stay neutral right. <laughs> as expected with that that particular proposal. Let the commission uh, do the, the thorough work on that. But uh, Brian, what what do figures show right now as you're looking at that with? saturation of the market. So we haven't seen the studies okay. yet for now, but when the studies were conducted in 2017, the last time we had looked at Lynn County, um, th there was a, a projected significant market impact at that time, and it was greater than we had mm. uh, ever seen uh, when going through a, an application process. Still a very close decision. It was 3-2. There are other factor factors that are involved in these decisions, not just uh, market impact. And so um, you know, five years later, um, it, it's, it's, it, we are interested to see what has changed. Uh, the population of Iowa hasn't really grown, but we have seen a shift uh, to, to more urban areas. And so uh, it, it will be interesting. And, and we are waiting to see what these studies show uh, to get a better idea as, as to if there are any overserved or underserved markets in the state. And now you're seeing with like Minnesota eyeing sports betting, Nebraska moving forward with casinos, uh, that certainly plays a factor into this too. Omaha Council Bluffs going to be a, a much different state of gambling there. I mean, how, how do you weigh what's going on with other states? Yeah, exactly. So, so the the Nebraska impact is, uh, is projected to be uh, fairly material, and that is one thing that uh, this study will also look at. It wasn't just focused on Lynn County or other overserved, underserved markets. It really was to look at the impact of Nebraska, and that is our largest market currently in the right. state of Iowa with the three casinos there, and there is uh, a significant. Um, um, uh, revenue that comes from Omaha and Lincoln. And so uh, we are looking at that and, um, and, and that is something that we're paying very close attention to. Well, the Sioux City market will also have a competitor eventually in South Sioux City, Nebraska too. You're, you're exactly right. We will, we will see uh, competition there in Sioux City, so it will have an impact there as well. The, 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 maybe the, the difference in Sioux City there, we have a, a, a new casino, fresh casino, and they have maybe a better ability to compete against, uh, against the market there. But you're, you're absolutely right. We will see an impact in Sioux City. One of the things I covered uh, more than a decade ago was passage of the Iowa Clean Air Act. Mm -hmm. And casinos won an exemption. And the argument was that we need to be competitive with other casinos in other states where people can go in and light up and play the games. Um, advocates for the people who work there say they're being exposed to secondhand smoke and their risk of cancer is enhanced. Wes Erickey, why should casinos have a carve out, if you will, in the Clean Air Act? Casinos probably have some of the best filtration and ventilation systems 
around. We, we have to accommodate both smokers and non-smokers in a very acceptable indoor quality environment, and we do that per the ASHRAE 62 standards. We're bringing in fresh air several times every hour, and that's really helped even during this COVID as well as part of that. Uh, but so, um, and, and you know, and with the time, it was a, a, like about a 25 to 30 percent drop in revenue to have to do away with uh, you know that smoking. And, and, and compared to other states that did do that, and so we're, we're we we like to say that, you know, you know, allow you know, like adults to make adult decisions in adult venues. It's still legal in this country to, to smoking, and and so to be able to offer that, but to, we want to be proactive with, and we feel we are. And even for the you know for the, the employees, don't seem to have the complaints that I know of because we are doing such a proactive effort with our with our ventilation and filtration. So let's talk about the competitiveness issue. If I go to a casino across the river in Illinois, do I get to smoke? No. So if I go into a casino that's eventually built in uh, Nebraska, do I get to smoke? I don't know the answer to that. I'm not aware I'm, either. I'm I don't, not sure. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. I don't so know it's what not they, a competitiveness what... issue now, right, in the Quad Cities market? But it was a competitive issue where the, the Illinois, they didn't really want that to happen because their, their revenues dropped precipitously uh, for, for several years after that. Gentlemen, uh, Greyhound Racing is being phased out. Uh, the owner at the Dubuque uh, track says next year is probably their last uh, season. I'm wondering, what's the state of horse racing in, in Iowa? And Brian Rocco, we'll start with you. Is, mm -hmm. is that headed down the same path of eventually being phased out, or is horse racing still strong in Iowa? I think horse racing is very different than greyhound racing. There is a, maybe a larger uh, uh, agriculture reach. Uh, when you go to the backside, uh, uh, Prairie Meadows, for example, uh, there are a number of other businesses that are taking place back there selling feed, hay, uh, different supplies. Now, the horse racing industry uh, is seeing right now some si significant federal uh, legislation that uh, is being implemented, and it deals with medication reform. And so there will be a significant shift in how how uh, racing is regulated. In Iowa, we believe that we um, have um, very high standards and, and we don't believe there will be much uh, to change in the Iowa industry, but in the Midwest, there could be. And that would impact uh, uh, racing uh, opportunities and the amount of racing participants uh, that, that uh, are in these races. And what customers want is field size. They want to have uh, horses, uh, 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 higher field size in their races to wager. And we have seen that decline in the past few years. And so uh, it is something that we're watching. So you, you stole my follow-up question. So before I uh, go over to Wes, let, let me, mm -hmm. Let me ask you real quick on that. Uh, and we just saw there was a national headline because the horse that won the Kentucky Derby uh, died after a recent workout. So what, what, what is the um, assurance that in Iowa the horses are, you know, well taken care of and protected in, in every way that, that uh, advocates would say they should be? Yes. So uh, it's a layered approach. And uh, the, the best tool we have is, is drug testing and medication testing. And we test, uh, we spend a, a lot of money testing animals pre-race, post-race. We do out of competition testing, hair testing, and really to, to make sure that we understand what uh, uh, trainers are putting into the horses. In addition to that, uh, our staff, uh, we have veterinarians on staff. They do pre-race exams. They check every horse that runs in every race at Prairie Meadows. If they note that there is maybe some potential lameness, those horses will be required to scratch and so so uh, we, there's significant regulation to ensure that the animals here in Iowa <clears throat> are safe uh, we do still see um, accidents from time to time but our numbers in Iowa are much better than what we see across the, the country and Wes, to circle back what what is the status of horse racing do, do you agree that it's got a little longer shelf life here in Iowa yeah, I believe so it's certainly you have three different options of racing you have the thoroughbreds the quarters and the standard breads and so they're located throughout the state which has a strong agricultural base that, that Brian alluded to and and they they seem to be thriving and uh, Prairie Meadows I think does an exceptional job with their 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 racing product if you will and fan base and and the like so um, it'll it, it's got to be subsidized though not unlike you know the Greyhounds and so at some point in time you, do you have enough horses to race and I think that's what it really would come down to at some point but not in the next uh, few years I wouldn't anticipate. Brian Orilco what happens to the Iowa Greyhound Park once it closes? Is that uh, it's owned by an association now? 
Yeah, so the license is owned by the association. The property is owned, uh, it's actually owned by um, the city of Dubuque, but it's leased by uh, Q Casino mm -hmm. there. So um, uh, we have not uh, seen any formal plans, but uh, I expect that that area will be developed at some point uh, in the near future. And would the Racing and Gaming Commission have any role in determining what could be built there? Do you have a thumbs up or thumbs down on that since it was part of the regulatory framework of your, your organization? So the commission would ultimately uh, have to approve or, or reject any type of capital improvement project. And, um, and, and at this point, um, uh, I, I know there are, there are discussions and, and I expect that we probably will see some plans uh, in, in the next year or two. In the remaining uh, 30 seconds or so that we have here, uh, just curious, what has been the long-term impact of the ongoing coronavirus pandemic on your industry? Brian, we'll start with you. Yeah, it, it's really been the impact of all of these amenities. Uh, and, you know, gaming in Iowa is something where we've had uh, destination type facilities. Uh, we've seen a number of amenities close. Uh, and, and at this point, and, and, you know, buffets, uh, I'm not sure if we'll ever see buffets again uh, in all of the casinos. There still are some, but we're, we're, we're seeing these amenities uh, closing and, and, and they're still not opened at this point. Wes, how much did foot traffic go down percentage-wise? I think it was about 20% or 30% with admissions, uh, you know, for a while. And, you know, but, uh, and certainly our labor shortage, too, is you can't ignore that. I mean, the foot, I mean, just to get people there. So. And I can't ignore the clock. We are out of time, Very gentlemen. <laughs> thanks for joining us for this conversation. And thanks for watching this edition of Iowa Press. You can watch it anytime on iowapbs.org or you can watch it when it's broadcast on Friday nights at 7.30 and noon on Sunday. For everyone here at Iowa PBS, thanks for joining us today. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation, the Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Fuel Iowa is a voice and a resource for Iowa's fuel industry. Our members offer a diverse range of products, including fuel, grocery, and convenience items. They help keep Iowans on the move in rural and urban communities. Together, we fuel Iowa. Small businesses are the backbone of Iowa's communities, and they are backed by Iowa banks. With advice, loans, and financial services, banks across Iowa are committed to showing small businesses the way to a stronger tomorrow. Learn more at iowabankers.com.